May God bless you in the name of Jesus, and obviously, Happy New Year. My goodness, I would love to discuss something with you today that is just so practical. Uh, it's so simple, and yet, sadly, we lose sight of it virtually immediately. And that, you know, everybody makes a New Year's resolution, I'm going to change this, and I'm going to change that. But there is an enormous practicality, biblically, in taking stock and designing your future. The Bible says where there is no vision, my people perish. And then Habakkuk, it says, write the vision, make it plain, write it down. In Revelations, the Bible ends with a thought that's really amazing. And God says, I am going to do a new thing, write it down. Sometimes we don't even take the time to say, now wait a minute, what do I want to achieve this upcoming year? What do I feel God is leading me towards? What do I have to leave? You know, those uh, emotional uh, vampires that, you know, just suck the life out of you. What changes do I want? How do I want my life and my family or my future, my business to be better? And yet we just steamroll right into the new year. But calendar changes, as we've studied, threshold moments are really quite important to God. They define it. He's the one who makes the day, the lunar calendar. And yet, we don't take stock. We don't stop and pause deliberately. Very few people, very few, write their agenda or their vision for the upcoming year. They just go right on and it melds into one day after another, a month into a month and a year into a year. Before you know it, a decade has passed by. Now, I'm going to say something that seems harsh, but it's true. If we don't take time to steward our time and show God that it's important to us and we want to achieve something with His help and grace, that we have a design for what we want to do for Him, if we don't even write that down, if we don't take the time to analyze our own life, really, do you think he's going to give us a lot of things to steward for him? I doubt it. Look at what businesses do. They report quarterly earnings. They have more reporting and more metrics. You get on, you, now you can get all that stuff on the internet. My Lord, you, you can be dizzy studying everything about a dollar or the share price or tendencies or growth patterns, the graphs. I mean, it's extraordinary the amount of information that a company would embrace to ensure that their future is what they want it to be. But yet Christians who should be the most aware are sometimes the most dull. It says, break up your fallow ground. And to me, that's always been a fascinating scripture because what it means is, does God want me to have more ground? In other words, I can only plant a certain amount, but if I also have ground that's fallow that I can break up and, and put seed in, I, I get the idea God wants me to expand. And he's not chastising me. He's saying, wait a minute, there's a lot of potential there that you need to recognize and you need to do something about it and stop wishing and hoping. But I'm going to challenge you for this first Sunday that you take the upcoming week and you take a half hour a day to pray for, with God as to what He wants to achieve with you this year. And write down your thoughts. My Lord, it's, it's so valuable and important. Again, without a vision, my people perish. They, they can't be what they're supposed to be. They, they, they don't have a dream. Everybody dreams, but not everybody dreams the same way. Some people, no joke, have nightmares. They, they see the future so foreboding. No, plan out your future. January, I want to achieve this. February, God, I want to multiply it. I want this. When he says be fruitful and multiply, did he mean it? Or is it just, you know, wishful thinking? When he gives us these desires, these hidden dreams in our bosom, and yet somehow or another we put them away, no. Let this be the year of more, of increase. Like, everybody wants a double portion mantle. Wonderful, we're gonna study it in depth. 
But what's the mantle for? What, what exactly do you want the mantle? Give me the reason. What exactly is the purpose? What do you want to achieve? God, I want more anointing. I want to be used of God. I want a business. I want a wonderful spouse. Well, just exactly why? Just to be happy and self-gratification? Where does our Jesus come in the picture? When you read the Gospels, when he sends out the people, the charge is amazing. Whosoever believes shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Whosoever this, that, you'll have power. You can loosen, bind in heaven and on earth. For what reason? Meanwhile, if you don't design the year, oh my goodness, then why? Why, why be blessed? Simply because I want a better car, better house, apartment, TV? There's so many ill people and they, they have to be born. They have to be carried by others. Our vision should be to make our lives and the lives of others far better than it was December 31st. We, yeah, you bet. You should ask God to increase you, to bless you indeed, Jabez's prayer. Expand me, Father. Keep evil far from me. Put your hand upon me and don't let anything grieve me. But I no longer want to be who I am. I want to be something far greater. I no longer want to just satisfy myself and others. I want to satisfy God. I want a dream and a burden, a vision in my bosom that says increase for Jesus. Along the way, he'll bless you beyond measure. But I truly want to put God first. Now listen to this. One of the most famous scriptures of all, Matthew 6, 33, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. So what God is saying is, I got a kingdom that I want to build. Seek that kingdom. Seek my interest. Seek my government. Seek my way of doing things. I want my kingdom built. And if we will be kingdom conscious this year, and somehow or another give thought to God and say, you know what, Lord? Nothing is impossible with you. Let's go for a ride. Tag along with him and say, God, I don't want you to be the co-pilot. Get out of that seat and get you get into the co-pilot seat. Let him be the co-pilot. You follow exactly what he says to do. But my Lord, I'm, I'm going to employ you and urgently repeat it. Take stock. The Bible says in Proverbs, look well to the matter. Know the state of your flock. And I'm admonishing you, charging you, challenging you to be practical in the kingdom and get a piece of paper or your phone, your tablet, and sit down and say, okay, God, you and I, let's get a vision for this year. What do you want? And then I'm going to tell you what I want. Let's, let's get together, God, and achieve this as co-laborers. But I'm not going to go randomly sailing into the year and ignore the threshold. I will not do it. I'm going to really think, pause, and meditate and see if I'm not going to have good success. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, that Christianity was handled, get this, professionally. It's time that we stop living in the reproach. It's time that we show the world that we are the children of God. Elijah had a fascinating prayer, and I, I wish you would attach it to your new year. When he was confronted with the 850 prophets, the challenge was clear and simple. Somebody's got to get God to answer. Somebody has to display the real creator of the universe. Someone, they try, they fail. But then comes this prayer. It says, you know, God, these people need to know who you are. But there's one additional thing they need to know. They need to know that I'm your man, that I'm your woman, and that you sent me. They need to see that I'm affirmed by God. And the God that answers by prayer and the servant that gets him to do so, they're going to recognize and realize these are the people of God. Christianity has become a byword. 
It's virtually without any influence in this world. Let this be the year of more, where God anoints you more, gives you more, manifests more, demonstrates more, heals you more, blesses you more, prospers you more, more. Just don't settle. Ah, uh, you can do better than that. You can. For the vision is for an appointed time. According to God, that's a threshold term. A time where the clock changes, where the season changes, where the vision comes into play. Part of the prophecy of Joel, which is manifested at the very beginning of the New Testament, is that men and women will have dreams and visions, that they will now be able to communicate in the spirit and see things. A vision is the capacity to see the future in clear terms. A vision is you have the bold impulse to say, I'm not settling for what I currently have. But I see something far greater in the future, an expansion, a largeness, more. And I see that's what I feel in my spirit I want. And I'm not going to just let it lay dormant any longer. I'm going to create a plan to a vision with God. And I'm going to sit down and ask him, show me the way. The Bible says that God will tell you. Don't walk to the left or to the right, but you hear a voice behind you telling you, this is the way, walk ye in it. But you have to ask for it. It's not going to twinkle dust on your head. You have to have a predetermined, strong desire, plan, outlook for what you want to achieve. And if the world is so practical, why can't we be when we're the ones that have the anointing? Why can't you say, Father, I want the gifts of healing to display in my hands this year. Why can't you ask for it? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And when then we ask amiss. We don't even know the purpose behind it. So why don't you say, dear Lord, I want the gift of discernment. I want to be a preacher. Give me the gift of speaking. Let me understand the Bible. Do not let the year pass by without a plan. I hope you hear that. Do not, if you're going to be so lackadaisical about it, so cavalier about it, that it's that meaningless, well then, that's the way it's going to be. As a man thinks, so is he. So I'm challenging you. People go to school for 8, 10, 12, 15 years to become an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer. They spend lots of time honing their craft. A sports athlete, my Lord, he's dedicated 8, 10 hours a day, he or she to their body, to practicing. Dancers sweating in the practice rooms, so thoroughly difficult, yet challenging themselves. Everyone works this hard. A work week of 40 hours is nothing. Some men work two jobs, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Couple that with the traveling. Good Lord, life encompasses work. And then there's an individual that can change everything you do with just a whisper of a word in your life. And to him, we pay really very little heed, comparatively speaking. But if you were to sit with your Lord for a half hour, an hour, and say, Father, what's the plan? What do you want me to do to build your kingdom? And then he says, if you would build my kingdom, whatever you ask, I will do for you. There's an interesting scripture in John 15. I urge you read that chapter and tag it for your new year. He says that he's going to be crucified. We know the story. and He's going to be tortured. But it, he goes on to say, wherever I am, there you will be also. It's a fascinating teaching that Christ is saying, you're my body. You have to do this as well. You have to obey that this is my year and you should be concerned about it for me. It's just not consumption. It's seeking the kingdom first. And I know this message may not resonate with a lot of people.
because it doesn't itch the ear or tickle the bone. But I am giving you the secret by the grace of God on how to be blessed. And that is truly to put God first. Sometimes, listen, God withholds simply because we have the order mixed up. If you read the book of Haggai, he's saying, listen, I'm the one you're up against. It's not the economy. You didn't make a bad dis business decision. You didn't purchase the wrong stock. You didn't go and you know, do the wrong schooling. No, you don't understand. It's me that's thwarting your success. Well, Lord, why would you do that? Because it's good for you for me to do that. Because your priority is so skewed that you're going to end up going so far wrong, I may not be able to reel you back. So I'm not letting you excel. It's me, not the devil, not the enemy. And I'm being clear with you, he says. It is me that is stopping you from progressing. It's that clear. Tie that to Matthew 6, 33. But he tells you in Haggai, I have a job for you to do, and you're not doing it. You're so consumed with building yourself that you don't care that there's a lady down the block that's broken and sick. And though I've given you the power to heal, to preach, to loose and bind in heaven on earth, I've given you the Holy Spirit of God to witness me and heal those people. You don't. You're too busy, too consumed with your own life, whether it be your children, your wives or husbands, your homes, your desires. Everything is your desires, he says. And he said, no, if I adjust you and you seek me first, my kingdom, my desire, and everything that you want, you won't have to strive for. You will not have to struggle for. I'm a good father. I'm a good husband. I will gladly give it to you. I want to give it to you. I want to bless you. It's my pleasure to prosper you and bless you. It's not a strain. I have everything you ever need. I want to give it to you. But not in that order. Never in that order. And so he withholds. So I want, I urge you, this upcoming year, make a pact with God. Tell them this will be the year where you give him more, where you start a cell group, start an international lighthouse, where you help someone open a church, where you preach to someone. Let me give you a story. A young lady came over to me the other day and said, what do I do because I have someone in a foreign country and they want to start a church for us. How do I do that? I said, well, do you know the lady? I do. I said, but how many people do I need to start a church? And I said, honey, you need one person, and that's the Holy Spirit. Most of the works we've started were with one person. We've had churches started by people preaching to empty chairs for months at a time. Just keep preaching, but nobody comes. Oh, they'll come. Just keep preaching. But there's nobody in the room. Oh, yes, there is. Keep preaching. You just don't see them yet, honey. Just keep preaching. You're going to get, you're, you'll see, keep preaching. And they do. You may call that foolish, but the tens of thousands of people that have been saved in those churches, I don't think they call it foolish. Make a pact with God. You're going to do something for him. You're going to get people saved. You're going to work at God. You're going to give him your effort. You're going to seek his kingdom first. And watch what happens. Why don't you try it for a month? Try it for the month of January. Put God first in all things. That even means your character. For example, if I'll give you a silly example. If you know someone who's loose in their mouth and they don't say edifying words where they're either very critical or they even slander or they curse and they say bad words, well, why don't you say to yourself, if you're that person, God forbid, I'm going to fast my words for one month. I'm going to change my character. Even this, don't be sensitive, but even overweight people. What You can fast for God one month. You can put away the foods that cause you to gain weight for one month. You could do that, I guarantee you. God will never try you more than what you can do. So for a month, you're going to say, my character is going to be stronger than it's ever been because I'm crossing this threshold with Jesus, and I'm gonna get an anointing that I didn't have last year. I want more, God. I want more. I'm not gonna settle for who I was. 
So whatever you need to change or be better, if your dis disposition is disagreeable, you're gonna say for a month, I'm gonna smile. And I'm gonna make sure whatever I say is gonna be kind and gentle to people. For one month, I'm gonna dominate myself. Ladies and gentlemen, all that was said to say the following, and this is the hard part of the message. This is where the rubber meets the road and seriousness takes over. You see, God left with a mandate for his churches, one that has been very frankly ignored by virtually 99% of the Christians on this planet. It's an astonishing seduction by the enemy to lull the purposes of God to sleep. The people are unaware, and my people perish for a lack of knowledge. The Christian community has very little discernment of who they are and why they were saved in the first place. I urge you to prayerfully consider what I'm about to tell you. Don't reject it. Have an open ear gate, because it can and will astonishingly change your life. You see, the level of disobedience in the Christian community is something that would never be accepted in any business endeavor, any college or university, any relationship. A level of just a callous ignoring of the heart of another party is considered quite bad taste. In a marriage, it would destroy it. In a business, they would break up as partners. In a university, no one would come if we did not consider the feelings of another. When we're talking that this individual is the creator God who formed us in the first place, who gave us our life to begin with, it's astonishing that we would ignore him. Here's where it begins, if you'll allow me three, four minutes that might be difficult to hear. The Bible says that we were born, we were slaves of the enemy, of Satan. You don't have to teach a little child to lie. It just comes natural, unfortunately. That we have the image of an evil one. I know that's hard to hear, but again, look at society. You don't have to teach them to do this bad stuff. They just do it. All the laws in the world don't stop them from doing it. They do it. There's evil. So along comes our Savior, our Creator. And you know the story, he takes the place of suffering so we would not have to. And he saves us. And we are born again now in his image. And we're now children of God. But there's a tremendous disconnect. We think we're no longer slaves. That's not what the Bible says. And it surely is not what God says. God says, I purchased you from the evil one. I paid such a price for you that you really don't understand it. We just make movies and shows about it. But I killed my own son and put evil on him when he never knew what that was so that you would be free. But I purchased you. I ransomed you. I redeemed you. And now you belong to me. You're not free. No, I took you from one slave owner and now I made you my child and I'm your daddy. So now you're going to serve me and do what I say. No, the Christian community does not do that. They are deceived, ladies and gentlemen. They do not do that. Truth be told, they do not. You see, his last words on earth, he gave something called the Great Commission. Read it. It's short in Matthew 28, Acts 1, and the end of Luke and Mark 16. Just read it in the end of John as well. Read it. And he says, all power, all authority is given unto me. I'm restored to the Godhead. I am now once again one with my Father and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, go into the world, preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, and teach them everything that I have commanded you. And the Christian community reads it, and doesn't do it. Because if I were to ask in this room, even though you guys are amazing, and people watching, which are amazing, still there's an enormous population out in this earth that they don't have one disciple. Not one. A Christian without a disciple. Ignoring the very basis of 
the cross of Christ. It's really not in good taste. It's to be saved and then not care about saving anyone else. It's God bless me, give me a good job, make my children safe, give me a good spouse, protect me, don't let sickness come, give me good money, good house, give me a vacation, let me have peace. And I get all that and then don't give a darn that the guy down the block is in agony inside his soul. No, I'm too busy. Ante is coming and we have to go antiquing. Costco's got a TV on sale. Darn, I gotta get there before they run out. Black Friday, online in the cold. Oh man. We ignore the basis of why he saved us and kept us here. He wants much fruit. He wants each and every one of us to make disciples. It's not enough. It's a good start to give someone a flyer and save them. Yes, it's wonderful, but that's not what it says. It says we have to work. It says we have to care so much that even though they may be difficult, we have to care because we want someone to care about us. It took over two and a half, three years to get this miserable soul saved. They plowed. If they would have just given me a flyer, yeah, give me a break. It's work to make a disciple. It requires commitment to the cause of Christ. But I tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, one day, soon, everyone will be standing before the throne of God. And he's going to ask you a question. It's right there in Matthew. What did you do for me? If you love me, did you feed my sheep? If you love me, did you take care of my children? Did you clothe them? Did you disciple them? Show me your disciples. You cannot go to heaven alone, ladies and gentlemen. Don't take that chance. Don't. I, it, please. I don't know what Bible you're reading, but don't take that chance. Yes, we're saved by grace. Absolutely. And the minute we receive grace, should we not be giving that grace to someone else? Should we be not forgiving their sins and showing them that God loves them no matter what? Keep falling, I'll keep picking you up, but we're gonna make it through. Should we not say, look at my disciples? I once visited a church with a bunch of leaders and men, and I asked them the question, I'd like to see your disciples. Every head went down. Every head was embarrassed. Every single one. I said, my God, no one has a disciple? I remember sitting in that chair. I was brokenhearted. And I said, if this is the state of the Christian community, and we don't love enough to save someone, a disciple is someone who can stand on their own two feet, someone who can make a disciple, that's a disciple. And until you duplicate yourself and make men and women strong in the Holy Ghost that can go out and preach the gospel and make other disciples, you haven't done it yet. And if you think this is a foreboding message, it's probably the best message you're ever going to hear. Start your year by telling the Lord Jesus Christ, I want that quiver to be full. I want to make disciples. I want to please you, God, and put you first. And if somehow or another that doesn't resonate in my heart, tell God, make it resonate in my heart. Make me fall in love with you. Make me love you more than anything in the world. And ladies and gentlemen, you by God's grace will have the best January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December you have ever had in the name of Jesus.